Welcome, folks, to another episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. This is episode number 77. And today's episode, folks, is going to be incredible. On the Lessons from the Cockpit Show, we interview some of the most fascinating and intriguing pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. On our show, we want to hear their stories, but more importantly, what did they learn from these extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and even general aviation events in their lives? The purpose of our show is to illustrate how does the aviation world work, but more importantly, increase critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. And today, folks, you're going to hear some stories that haven't been told anywhere else but here on the Lessons from the Cockpit show. And there's so much information, we may have to break this into two different shows. Today's show is supported by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. These are really detailed four, six, and eight foot prints of aircraft in profile views that are printed on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to any flat surface. We also do patches from the different units. These are so detailed, you can even see the stenciling on the missiles, the weapons, and we're doing a lot of upgrades to a lot of the drawings that we've done previously because we have found more information about the aircraft or whatever. But folks, go to wallpilot.com and order from the 140 ready to print or let us do a custom one for you. Tell us what airplane you want. What's your favorite airplane? We can put your name on it. We can put a tail number on it. We can even put the weapons load of your choice on the profile. These are extremely detailed folks and our financial support comes from the sale of these profile prints. So please go by wallpilot.com and order from the ready to print or send us a sheet that says, here's the custom one I want. Looking forward to hearing from you. On today's show, I was turned on to this by a very dear friend of mine, Scott Brown. And he said, you've got to go buy this website. And I did, and it was amazing. And so I called this gentleman and I said, I'd really like to have you on. And it took us a while to do this, but finally we got Navy A4 and A7 pilot from the Vietnam War, Bo Smith on. And folks, some of these stories you're gonna hear today are just bone chilling because he's going out and hunting SAM sites during the Vietnam War. So. Grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the 77th episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit show with Navy Captain Bo Smith, A4, A7 driver during the Vietnam War. Before I start today's show, we need to do a little admin queep. Queep is a word in the Air Force lexicon, meaning stuff to do. And the first one breaks my heart. I've mentioned my good friend Scott Brown on this show several times and his beautiful daughter, Reagan, who just recently got married. Scott lost his wife, Tracy, Reagan's mom, two weeks ago. Scott and Tracy have been friends of ours for a very long time, folks. She was an OBGYN nurse. Scott and Tracy live in Houston and she would go down there and spend several days working in a hospital down in San Antonio. And unfortunately, She is no longer with us. My heart goes out to Scott because these two loved each other like you can't believe. Scott and Tracy came out and spent a week with us at Iron Blossom Lodge up in Snowbird, and we just had a ball. And all of us here at the Lessons from the Cockpit show send our dearest condolences to my good friend Scott. I love you, brother. And we're so sorry that Tracy is no longer here. So please, folks, raise a prayer, raise a glass for my good friend Scott and his wonderful daughter, Reagan, going through a tough time right now without his beloved wife and uh, her mom. Second thing, I haven't published for almost four weeks, and there's a good reason for that. First of all, I have been on the road and got a fantastic opportunity to actually do an interview on an airfield and it was the first base I was assigned to, Pease Air Force Base, now Pease International Air Park. The FBO out there called Port City Air and their director, Jamie McCarthy, who has now become a very, very good friend, 
we actually stood in one of the FB 111 drive throughs and I interviewed him as we had executive jets going by us, Atlas 747s going by us, a U.S. Coast Guard helicopter that was taking off. This is a very active airfield, and I didn't know a lot about fixed-based operations or FBOs, but folks, you're going to get an education on what it takes to run an operation like that where you have military and civilian aircraft coming in and going out, and then you have massive exercises and what it takes to do that. We're also going to have two Vietnam MiG killers come on. Uh, I've already interviewed one, doing the interview for another one on Monday, who happened to be a childhood hero, and we actually met face-to-face in Anchorage, Alaska at Elmendorf Air Force Base when I was on my mission for the Mormon Church 45 years ago. So look forward to those episodes coming in the next few weeks. Good morning, Bo, and welcome to the Lessons from the Cockpit show. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing great, sir. And thanks again for being on with us. I have really been looking forward to having you on the show for a couple of months since uh, Scott Brown said, hey, I think you need to have this guy on. He's got some great information. And your website, oh my gosh, Bo, is fabulous. Fabulous. So why don't you tell us who you are real quick? And in that introduction, tell everybody about your website so everybody goes there too, okay? okay? All right. Well, I uh, came into the Navy through the NROTC program at Cornell University. And when I went through flight training in 1964, 65, my wife said, you know, we had, I had an instructor that had a bunch of Korean War ribbons. And she says, you know, it's too bad you won't get a chance to do any of that. <laughs> well, that didn't work out that way. But, yeah. but uh, anyway... I decided I wanted to fly the attack mission. You know, uh, it doesn't take, although the fighters at those days were the F-8 Crusader, which was a great airplane, mm-hmm. and uh, but it was going to the F-4 Phantom, and that's the fighter mission, but I didn't want to drill a bunch of holes, so I wanted to go attack targets. So I was fortunate to get through the training command and into the BA-44 A-4 RAG, which is the equivalent of a RTU in the Air Force. And uh, in 1965, and just as they decided to set up a carrier called the Dixie Station Carrier, and this was going to be attack-oriented, no fighters. The whole purpose of it was to do close air support and direct air support. So it's an attack pilot's dream. So that's where I started, in Dixie Station, in the Mekong Delta. And then we went from there. So we'll we'll talk about where to. Okay. uh, And then you flew A-7s also. I flew A-7s later on in 72, and we'll we'll get to that. Yeah. And you and I were just talking about the differences between the two airplanes. Why don't you talk about that, about a dumb airplane and a smart airplane? Yeah. Well, the A-4, the scooter, was probably the most fun to fly. And you were part of the airplane. You know, I'm, my shoulders were on the canopy rails. My head was on the canopy. There was really very little room in there. And all we had to deliver weapons with uh, at the time was an ADI, a, a, a gyro that gave you what your what your uh, dive angle was, and an altimeter, and a and a hard and a hard gun sight. That was it. So it was a dumb airplane. There was nothing smart about it. No computers involved. You had to learn how to. The skill of delivering uh, an ar- a weapon, depending on what it was, and, and we'll get to that. And the weapons themselves were dumb. They were iron bombs. Most of the we what we dropped in Vietnam were thermally coated, but we did drop some non thermally coated World War II and Korean weapons, uh, and uh, which during the Forestall Fire became a subject to that because we. We really dropped. We got. We were dropping too many bombs. We didn't, we ran out of bombs at the time. And I'll talk to her about. It. There were times where we went flying with two or three bombs instead of six or ten. Uh, but the aircraft had it had a centerline station. Basically, the A four A and B old ones just had a centerline station and one wing station on each wing, and that's what we went into South Vietnam with. In the A4B, we had carried a centerline tank, had weapons on each wing, and we carried either bombs or rockets. We had five-inch rockets, and we had 2.75 rockets, and we had a little gun that was in the airplane, which was which was good. Mm-hmm. wasn't a great gun, uh, the Mark 12 gun, but at least it was a gun. When we were going in 1965, as they put together the Dixie Station Carrier, 
we had Jerry Tuttle, who got to be a very famous admiral in the Navy, uh, was the lieutenant commander. He handpicked out of two or, th- or three or four classes guys for the squadron. We ended up, those JOs ended up going for two cruises in Vietnam, 200 missions flying together. That was just totally different than most places have people come and go in this time. But here, we actually had the same nine or 10 junior officers, uh, the core of the junior officers, and the same lieutenant commander division leaders, Jerry Tuttle, Lieutenant Commander Possum Terrell, and First Lieutenant Ron Ron Monroe, who who, the three of them became very famous pilots, and they were our division leaders. Our COs and XOs kind of come and went. Mostly they were too old and 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 uh, good guys, but really didn't lead the squadron tactically. The the three lieutenant commanders did. And the JOs, we really got very good at bombing because we didn't have to worry too much getting shot at. We could make individual runs on targets with a close air support, with a FAC flying a Piper Cub down in the Meek Island Delta and just one bomb at a time and really got to perfect uh, our bombing technique. Uh, we also had napalm. And I remember one mission particularly well where we, where this was very unusual at the beginning part of the war. The army was, it was U.S. Army personnel carriers and the, the VC were lined up behind the berm of a rice paddy in black pajamas, literally right down, right behind the berm. And we had napalm. You know, we just went and dropped napalm, two napalms per airplane, eight napalms right down the line of those VC. I mean, they didn't use those tactics very long before, you know, but at that time it was pretty, pretty bad as for, for them anyway. It's like lining up in the Revolutionary War. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was a really, it was very unusual. You didn't, we had very little times where we'd see kind of a, a peace war, you know, where you could identify the front lines and all that. Most of the time, but we were going to a FAC, and the FAC would shoot a Willie Pete rocket into the trees, and we would bomb the trees. Mm-hmm. And we'd call that direct air support. <laughs> Occasionally, the trees would blow up because we were bombing a weapons cache. Or... The fact would say, "Oh, I'm taking, I'm taking some fire, and they go ahead, and it's coming from so and such." And we would go ahead and direct it there. We didn't see much other than his flares. We we had bombs. We had five inch Zuni rockets, a wonderful weapon, forward firing. Uh, you could do some damage with it, and it was very accurate. Then we had these Lao three pods that had 27, 2.75 rockets in it, and they went every which way, but they looked impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and we had napalm. One of the fun things was the the fuses of our napalm weren't very good, and the, the napalm would hit, and you see this big thing of fuel and nothing. It wouldn't go on. So we developed a tactic where the wingman would strafe the lead's napalm with HEI and light it up. Oh. You would go in right off right off the wing. Watch his napalm go in, and you end up getting pretty low, and drop it off. Then swap the lead, and then you'd put your napalm, and the lead would strafe it, and you, it was more fun. And you really got to learn how to fly formation because we were moving. We were pretty low level for some of these yeah. missions, and so we were we kept the air speeds up. And uh, so there's a lot of G's involved, and a lot of napalm drop. It was pretty spectacular. So. And we didn't get a lot of fire. We didn't have to worry too much about it. Nobody got, we never got a hit, an airplane hit. The only times we did was when we flew too low ourselves and yeah. either got into some bomb, our own bomb blast or yeah. bounced off a river, which happened a couple of times. People would come back with med, mud on the top of their wings. And <laughs> oh, plane captains would go crazy. And uh, <laughs> what have you been doing with my airplane? <laughs> yeah, we, had, we had one guy that actually flew through the, the roof, of a tile roof of a house on a low pullout. Uh-huh. And the fact went crazy. He says, I've seen a lot of things, but I've never seen the airplane fly through the target. Yeah, and come home with I, tile in the wings. The guy came back with tile in the slats of the, the A4 had slats in the four edges of the wings. And he had those, his slats were jammed with red tile from the roof of that. Because in the A A4, when you if you pulled on the G's, you could pull the slats out. 
So you could actually have G on there, which he did. On a low pullout, he probably had about six Gs. So those slats were out, and then he hits the roof, and he recovers, and the slats try to come back, and they can't. Anyway, we are more dangerous to ourselves than the other side. <laughs> that changed after the first line period. Uh, we went from the Mekong Delta. Uh, we started moving up north. And I, I might be, I'm in a very few group of persons who actually have flown from the Mekong Delta doing close in air support and direct air support and flown all the way up the length of the South Vietnam and then in Rupec 2 through 6 Bravo and North. We had another mission which was kind of very interesting because it was unusual. Across the Mekong Delta to an area called the Three Sisters, which is right near the Gulf of Thailand. So it's all the way across the Mekong Delta. And we got out there, a flight of four A4s with a fac in a little village that called everybody in from the farms and then everybody that was outside the village gates were VC. And the VC were mortaring, using wow. mortars on the village from the hills. So we could see the mortars. Mm -hmm. And we had Zunis. Here we are shooting Zunis at the mortars. You know, it was a good feeling because we saved the village. Then bombing was a whole, was different on the, trying to bomb somebody that's on the side of a hill is hard to do. So it's nice to have a forward firing thing like a Zunis. Why is that, Bo? Well, because because the bombing, you tend to be long or short. So if if the, if it's if you have a flat surface, it's a little easier. You know, if you're a little long on a bomb, that's going to be up the hill and, or down the hill to try to get it right on a on a hilly angle uh, is, a, is a challenging yeah, issue. Got it. All the practice you're doing. Is in a you know in Kansas where it's flat, right? <laughs> or, or, uh, the, the only practice you have, even anyway, we went we would we would go to Yuma, Arizona, and we'd bomb some in the Chocolate Mountains with live ordnance. Yeah. Memory is that most of that those targets were pretty flat. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, the same. No, we were much better bombers. So when we got finished with that line period, with all that practice, two flights a day one bomb at a time with a fact, uh, we were very good bombers, which which was which would serve us well as we move north, uh, being an accurate. The closer your CP is, the cir circus uh, area probable to the target, the more effective your bombs are, so the fewer missions you have to fly on the target. So you transition from A4s to A7s. And now yeah. you've got computers and all kinds of things that yeah. are helping you put bombs on target. Talk about that for just a moment. And, and a, we haven't talked about the A4 in 67 during Rolling Thunder with the targets we were okay. doing. We were doing Iron Ant and all that. So okay. we, we'll talk to that at some point. But mm -hmm. if you're in an, uh, a SAM environment and you're in an A4 and you have a missile, let's say two shot at you, it's pretty easy to defeat that missile. That first missile, you see it, yeah. you, you drop the nose, you you get to keep your airspeed up, you put some Gs on it on the airplane. Those missiles, those SA-2s were designed to hit a B-52 at 20,000 feet that's not pulling a lot of Gs. So the, they, they, the, they just couldn't turn. But it was so it wasn't the first missile. It was the second or the mm -hmm. or the second from one site and another one from. So you have two different sites shooting at you. Then it gets more difficult and about all you can do a split S spiral to, to lower altitudes. When you do that in the A4, you, if you're inland, you really don't have any idea where you are. To try to get back to the target, you're lucky if you can get back to the where the ocean or the sea is and get back to the Tonkin Gulf. It destroys your ability to get to the target. In the A7, because you have a, a navigation system that's inertial nav, and you have a flight path marker to the target, you can do that SAM maneuver, and then all you have to do is fly the airplane to the flight path marker, and it takes you right back to the target. So it's much easier to exist in the SA2 environment uh, in a smart airplane like that. So it's uh, pretty good. And we'll get to about the altitudes were much different. Uh, in 66, of course, when we went north, in, we had A4Bs, and we had no ECM equipment at all. We had the APR-27, which told you 
when a SA-2 was in the air. But we didn't have any countermeasures, nothing. And we had no fighters. So we pretty much stuck to coastal routes, Mm -hmm. the coastal targets. Yes. We did go inland a couple of times up there. But we got a lot of practice getting up there and surviving in the A-4B. Then we turned around and went home and had a really quick turnaround. We changed airplanes to the A-4Cs, and we were designated Iron Hand. So we were flying the Shrikes and Zunis against SA-2 sites. And we were pretty effective because we could get right over the top of a SAM site in orbit at twelve or 14,000 feet. Our guess was they were going to shoot us. They had to save their missiles for the strike group. That was We were out in front of the strike group. Ten minutes sometimes, well out in front. They also wouldn't want to commit their MiGs because as soon as they would commit their MiGs, we had bar cap. Not from our – we had no fighters on our ship, but there were F-4s from other ships, and the Ariskini had uh, air – there were two kinds of F-8s. F-8s for air-to-air guns, F- F-8s for air-to-ground. But So we were out there betting that they would not shoot at us. Uh, and once we got over website or SAM sites that were occupied, we just orbit there waiting. When the strike group came in and they turned their fan songs on, we would shoot right down the throat. Oh, and if if we expanded our strikes, we'd shoot uh, five inch rockets. It was a very uh, these tactics were very effective, I thought. But it was only because we could orbit the target. In 1972, we came back. They had the ZSU quad-mounted ZSU-23 defending those sites, and those guns could shoot accurately up to 12,000 feet rapid fire, and we no longer could orbit those SAM sites. We had to stand off and kind of lob the Shrike into the basket. Much different. And those were radar-directed guns, too, weren't they? Yeah. we. You know, if you stayed above 12,000 feet, you get down 10, 12,000 feet, they can barrage fire. 3757 without any radar. They just put barrages up there. There were some some radar controlled 57 millimeters, but most of the most of the radar controlled guns were 85 or 100 millimeter. Okay. I don't know if I ever saw any 100 millimeter, but I saw lots of 85. Yeah. And it could get up there around, you know, 15, 18,000 feet. But our ECM gear was really good. Uh, mm-hmm. Those fire can, flap wheel, conical scan, radars, uh, we had a range gate pull-off on them, and I can't tell you how many times I heard you know, the radar come in, solid tone, and then go off because the ECM gear drove it off. So uh, once we were, we we're up about 18,000 feet, the only thing they could shoot at us was really radar control, 8,500 8, and the SA-2s. Uh, and we lost very little airplanes in route to the targets. We lost all our airplanes in the target area, in the dive bomb run, or on pull-offs. That's where one advantage of the A-7 in 1972 was that we could drop our bombs much higher because the mm-hmm. system would allow us to roll in at you know, 12, 14,000 feet, and we would be releasing our ordnance at 8,000, and we were out of there well above 5,000 feet. Where in the A-4, we're rolling in at ten or twelve thousand feet. We're we're releasing at five thousand feet, and we're pulling out at three to four thousand feet. So at three to four thousand feet, you're you're really you got a lot more things can shoot at you, yeah. and uh, and that's where the hits were. That's where mm-hmm. I got hit on the mission that I got hit was pulling off on a Mark thirty six destructor mine mission at the Haiduang Railroad and Highway Bridge. And even though, and I we were tail in charge, we were the last section in, and I told my wingman, we're going whatever way everybody in front of us goes, we're going the other way. So we did, <laughs> but still, you know, the airplane got hit. So, you know, you never, once you get down around those altitudes, and of course, they only had SA-2s, you know, when you just make a few years after that, now they have SA-3s and SA-6s and all kinds of stuff, and those are more low-altitude type yeah. SAMs, uh, much tougher environment. You can't. You just can't get down in that in that area with them. So today, it's all standoff weapons. You don't. You don't get that down the clutch. You asked me what what I thought was really important. Few things for me in our environment in those days, the ability of formation flying skill was really important. You had it was section integrity. 
And you had that wingman had to be able to stay with you no matter what the leader did. Didn't make any difference. Wingman had no excuse ever. Even if the lead was in full power, you know, you just had to learn to use the turn as need be and stay with them. So formation, you never wanted to be alone up there. So formation flying was really skilled. We got really good at it. Yeah. And we also flew with the same people all the time. And as I said, here I had these, you know, same three lieutenant commanders, and I flew with one lieutenant, lieutenant commander, Possum Terrell, pretty famous guy. I have almost 200 missions with him, and and that's that's very important to, to be able to do that. Uh, when I was flying the 105, I was Ted Tolman's wingman, and we were on a uh, basic flight maneuver, BFM, which is two sections, and I was a wingman on the Tolman section. And a guy named Captain Paul She, who was in the, the book Thud Ridge too, as a young guy, uh, he was a wingman on the other section. And he said to me, "I don't believe you could stay with Ted Tolman." And I, I told him, and it was true. I said, "I am an average Navy combat wingman. We can fly. We can fly with anybody." And I was doing things in the 105, like using rudders to keep the fuselage of the 105 parallel with Tolman at three and four G's. And people just don't, the average people just don't fly like that. And I could stay with terrible Ted. And I gained, I got a lot of brownie points from those air force guys. Cause here's this Navy a four pilot who can fly the 105 in formation at the, at whatever the other guy's doing. Well, so that was in the environments we were looking at. In 1966 and 67, and still in seven in 72, formation flying skill was that was survival. Yeah. The other thing that I have in there is that where the Navy has an, had an advantage over the Air Force is that each air wing sort of had their own tactics. From the air defense commander's viewpoint, you never knew. If you had the Ariscani, the Constellation, and the Intrepid, those are three air wings doing different tactics. Mm -hmm. And where the Air Force coming out of Karat and Takli, where the kids would go in there, the Air Force is flying pretty standard tactics. I mean, to the point where when B-52s did linebacker, or linebacker two, you know, they came down the same sack, had them going down the same uh -huh. line. No wonder they got, plus the SA-2 missile was designed to it should be 52. So, uh, by because our tactics were always going to be a little different. Uh, in 1967, there are three of us, three carriers up there, the Ariscani, the Intrepid, and the Constellation. Here's the Intrepid that has, you know, A4Cs, Iron Hands, though. Yeah. No fighters, except we had, we had a detachment of Sundowners that were very, very famous. Tudor Tig, Joe Zatrapi, Tony Nargi, with yeah. in F eights. And those guys didn't do mid cap. They did tar gap with us and they never left us. They were really good. The mid cap and the bar cap had to come from the constellation because that's they're the only ship that had yeah. F4s. And the Ariscani. So we would go three carrier strikes, three carrier air wings, and one target. The Constellation and the Intrepid, we were at 18,000 feet, and the Ariscani, they were in route altitudes were 12,000 feet because they didn't trust their ECM gear. And at the end of the cruise, the the Intrepid and the Constellation lost 25 airplanes, and the Ariscani lost over 50. Oh, my gosh. With just a little, the tactics were different. Yeah. And that's the... But in 66, of course, the Ariski made did some famous missions, the, thermi, the Hanoi Thermal Power Plant mm -hmm. uh, with walleye ones, and, you know, it was just really yeah. pretty, pretty famous uh, strikes. Yeah. But they, they maintained the same tactics in 67 as they did in 66, and it, and they they lost airplanes because of it. You know, they'd go en route, and 37, 57 could shoot at them. We were well above it. So that was That's my amazing. that was my second uh, my third one is uh, uh, limit your exposure in the target area, <laughs> which which made a difference between the A four and the A seven. A fours are delivering their ordnance at forty five degrees of bank and releasing at five thousand feet and pulling out at 
three and four thousand feet. Mm -hmm. The A seven was rolling in at twelve and thirteen thousand feet and was out of there uh, altogether by five or six thousand feet. So the, you never got you, you just a, you weren't in it long a lot for you know, if it's barrage kind of fire and it's not aimed. You don't want to jink. That's the other thing. Inexperienced pilots are out there jinking around. If it's barrage pilot fire, you want to go in a straight line. You you want to limit the amount of time you're there. You don't need to be jinking around. It's only the aimed fire. And the North Vietnamese got really good at that. They mixed uh, aimed uh, 85 millimeter in with barrage 57 millimeter. So you you pretty much had to, you know, there was a lot of stuff being shot yeah. up. So anyway, it was it was uh, a lot of interesting missions. And you mentioned on your website that you did like I think you called it road recce, road reconnaissance, and you do it at night. We did a also. lot of we did a lot of road reconnaissance, which is looking for uh, truck parks, looking for sometimes single bicycles with an eighty-five millimeter shell strapped to the guy's back. <laughs> You know, really, but by Mary, you're looking for trains, which I never saw, but you're looking for Wiblex, which are waterborne logistics, logistics craft, and trucks, that kind of stuff, and yeah. truck. So you're flying three to 4,000 feet and kind of S turning over a road. And uh, because above that, it's interesting. Uh, we bombed the heck out of a truck that turned out to be a, wa a buffalo, water buffalo. Oh, no. Because, because you couldn't tell. They were both black objects on a road. Uh, you know, so you had to get a little lower to see what you were doing. When we moved up north in 66, we had possum flight, which was Lieutenant Commander Terrell, myself, and Dave Parsons. Now, Dave Parsons and I were both in the original 10 JOs. And we had flown together all those down south fact flights. So the lead was responsible for looking for the Wiblicks and et cetera. And we were flying these V8, these eight figure eights over them from section to section. And our job was to look for Sams and MIGs and fire and stuff like that. And once possums found something to bomb up, we'd call, pull up and do one run and be out of there. The first mission we were supposed to do was a, a road recce from Nam Din to Ninh Binh. And this was in Route Pack 5. And so we're out there and we're doing our recce pattern and Boston flew right over Ninh Binh and didn't see much. Well, all of a sudden we start taking all this fire. We say, what is this big bridge up here? We had road recce the San Juan Bridge on mm -hmm. one of our first missions up there. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, you got shot at, you got back to the ship. You had a glass of scotch, and you said, okay, I survived today. <laughs> and you learned as you went how to survive mm -hmm. uh, in the environment. Would you do this at night, though, too? Just the way it was. Night road wrecking? the way it was. What's that? You do night, uh, yeah. night road wrecking? Night how road wrecking was basically a waste of time. Uh, we couldn't do it in on Intrepid because we, we did all – we only did – flew in the daytime. So we didn't have to do it. But in, in the night in the A-7, we got tasked to do night road record. We even got tasked on one flight to fly an A-6 kind of profile, which is silly. You know, we, we didn't do it. I refused to do it. They expected us, me, to, to fly, fly an A-6 kind of low-altitude radar. I didn't know what my wingman was supposed to be doing while I'm doing this. Yeah. One thing for the A-6 to do it. It's another thing for A-7s. But on a... A road recce, we would have four Mark 82s and two Rockeyes because by by 72, the Zuni rocket wasn't allowed carriers anymore because of the, not just John McCain's, but there were two or three incidents yeah. where a Zuni rocket fired on a flight deck. So it was replaced by the Rockeye. The Rockeye was a pretty good, because it covered so much area, it was a pretty darn good weapon. And with the A-7, you could toss it. You know, you didn't have to get down amongst them. Uh, you could toss it pretty much where you wanted to. So the question is, are you going to see anything? More than likely, you're not. So what we ended up doing, we knew the geographic position of some of the AAA sites, the bigger mm -hmm. AAA sites. We knew where they were. 
Yeah. And in the E7, you could toss bomb to a to a set of coordinates. So we would be up there. And wow. We would, so we would just toss a Mark 82 at 2 o'clock in the morning at some 85 millimeter site. And it was like the B-52 raids in the south, you know, along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Those four suckers, you know, they were just getting bombed through the rain. <laughs> <laughs> now, they might have got down in their tunnels, but yeah. to be able to just kind of, you know, keep them awake by tossing a Mark 82 into an 85 site was kind of a cool thing to do. Occasionally, uh, they might light up and you could turn around and put rock eye on them and do some damage. So uh, I always had three or four coordinates to put a bomb where I wanted to. Uh, there was one 85 site at Than Wong that shot at me a few times, and I always saved a bomb on a night road wrecking. <laughs> bomb in 82 to those guys. So yeah. uh, that's we weren't really able to do much. You know, we're up there road wrecking at night is kind of a silly thing. Now, yeah. there was some work about bombing under flares, and there was one squadron on the Riskity. I think they were on the Riskity. I think they were VA-152. The Golden Knights or something. They got really good at bombing under flares, and they were able to find a lot of trucks and stuff. Uh, but it was a dangerous thing to do. It was hard. You got vertigo easily that way. But most people refused to do that. Yeah. Everybody was bombing above the flares. Yeah, the flares, you could you could do some wrecking at night with flares, but vertigo was a problem for the pilots involved. But you could find some trucks. It's just that most people just didn't want to fool with it. But yeah. the one, this one squadron got very good at it. If you pick a tactic and you train to it, you can you can get more done than somebody who just tries it. So there's another case where you know, there's 152 bombing under flares and nobody else is doing it. So yeah, they were good at it. Yeah, and they were good at it. Yeah, they were good at it. So that I think that's I think that's in the book uh, about the. Sweet 16 or whatever, the bloody 16, that yeah. book has got talks about those guys. Yeah. But I don't think those guys were on Riskini. I think Riskini was 162 and 163. But anyway, not too sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure about 162 because our XO on, on the American 1972 was one of the guys who flew the thermal power plant uh-huh. raid in 66. Uh, off the Uh so uh, he knew a lot about. Interestingly enough, he wasn't on the the raid against the San Juan Bridge that dropped the San Juan Bridge. Yeah, when he writing that memoir, I I couldn't remember very much about the seventy two cruise. I had a few memories, yeah, but not many, and I had pretty much blacked out because there were some close calls yeah. in that in that time, and I had pretty much blacked out that whole thing. Uh, I, it wasn't until I started writing the memoir and I got mm-hmm. in my logbook and started talking to people about, you know, where I was able to unravel uh, some of the missions, especially the one on, on the uh, battle of that was there in South Vietnam that I wrote about. Mm-hmm. There was a really terrific, terrific use of bombs off A7s. And there was another time that Ray Thomas mentioned to me that we came in with four A7s and we had 10 Mark 82s each. We had 40 Mark 82s. Oh, geez. And, and uh, the fact calls us up and says there was a tank. I mean, you never saw a tank. So there was a tank and I was the flight leader and I dropped one Mark 82 to supposedly work around to finally get it. And that first bomb was a direct hit. The tank is gone. And so <laughs> what do you do with the other 39 bombs? You know, because that was the, the fact figure he'd work that target, you know, and have two or three flights work it. But you know, the first bomb, first bomb off that A7 was a direct hit on the tank. It was gone. It was gone. It's like hitting a rabbit with a 30 out six. Isn't it? Yeah, you know, I mean, it just blows the thing. You know, to smithereens. That was a, that was one of the huge differences about having a smart airplane. Uh, now, not that you can't couldn't accurately bomb off the A four. We had a between the cruises between sixty six and sixty seven. 
we had basically the same group of people. Yeah. And we had a bombing competition at Cecil Field. And Possum Terrell, who was a great bomber with a SPAD background, yeah. he had a 10-foot SCEP. 10 foot. And <laughs> me, when I was about 25, you know, but that was that's pretty good. Yeah. Lost. Possum lost <laughs> because Lieutenant J.G. Atkinson had six bullseyes. Oh. Iron sight bombing off an A4. I mean, so, you know, you could you could get good. Uh, yeah. It's like the Air Force in strafing. Mm-hmm. I, I I hadn't had the M61 gun yet because I hadn't, wasn't in an A7s. I didn't do A7s yeah. 172. So mm-hmm. 68, 69, I was flying 105s. And uh, I had to do my pittance in the AT-33 first mm-hmm. and then finally moved up to the 105. About the time that Hardinger, General Hardinger, became the wing, the the, the head guy. Mm-hmm. Who he ended up being 16th Air Force as a yeah. three star, and I, I was playing racquetball with him when he got we made Brigadier General. So I got to know he was really good treating me as the Navy guy. But mm-hmm. uh, I was I was shooting about 15 percent, which in the Navy is pretty good. Ted Tolman or George Bogart to somebody called me aside and says you can't be an instructor in the and shoot 15 percent. <laughs> because the Tolman and Martin are shooting 50 and 60%. Yeah. So he taught me how to strafe with slant range by comparing the the 1.9 mil pipper with a with a four foot bowl and when the two were the same the size, you're at two thousand feet. So here you're shooting at two thousand feet slant range in a one oh five at five hundred knots and you're pulling out around fifty or sixty, you know. But you're shooting the hell out of that target too. Yeah. So when I went back to the Navy in the A7, which is the same gun, yeah, yeah. I used I used the same techniques. Okay. So I was, you know, most guys were strafing at fifteen percent, and I was shooting 40 percent with a, in the A7 using the Air Force slant range techniques as opposed to because in the Navy you have mill sight setting and you're shooting at your altitude. Which is which? Which is much further out. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and air to air guns in the 105. We get on that dart. He'd be pretty close to it. We could obliterate it. Without <laughs> him. Yeah. There was slant slant range shooting was just something we didn't do. And even the Zuni rockets, we were pretty much shooting on a mill setting and an, a dive a, a dive angle and shoot at a certain altitude. Not at a suit and slant. So we used a lot of trigonometry. Yeah. We didn't use the calculus, but we used a lot of trigonometry <laughs> in <laughs> that iron sight, in iron sight bombing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot different. The, the last thing that I had on my thing was about compartmentalizing. Mm-hmm. You know, we get up there and we watch Top Gun and we see Goose with a picture of his wife. I don't know anybody that ever had a picture of their family in their jet cockpit in yeah. combat. It just, you had to be all business. That's, yeah. that's all. If you couldn't do that, uh, those are the guys that ended up holding high or staying safe and not yeah. jeopardized everybody. Um, I found out that one of my one of, VA 15 67 squadron mates was so scared he did that he, he you know uh, his leader would be road wrecking at three to four thousand feet south of in he would be holding at eight and ten thousand feet which was jeopardizing his wing his yeah. leader and i told him at the reunion you know if i'd known that you'd have lost your wings you know you just can't go in and and i know that there were some jos in the 72 crews we had a co it was just hell bent and getting a silver star, and he was doing stuff that would endanger anybody, as certainly as wingmen. Um, and so some of the wingmen refused to fly with him, fly with him, fly with him because he, he was just. A, there was a lot, a big difference in in the medal philosophy in the Air Force, and the Navy too, about one medal difference. Uh, <laughs> silver stars uh, were DFCs in the Navy. Air Force Silver Stars. And if you were a lieutenant, your chances of getting a DFC are really small. 
you're, you're, you're probably going to get in DFCs downgraded to individual air medals yeah. or accommodation medals. Mm -hmm. The DFCs were getting there in the Navy. That was what a strike leader was getting. A division leader, strike leader, he can always get a DFC. In the in the Air Force, they were getting silver stars, or in some cases, uh, like the Dover Bridge Ray. Right? There's four Air Force crosses, four or yeah. five Air Force crosses. Uh, not just uh, Harry Sure, but the the Wild Weasel. Yeah. Uh, Leader got an Air Force Cross for that. Uh, I'm not, I, you know, I, that's just kind of you know, it looks nice on there and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. you know, uh, I I thought that the JOs with 200 missions somewhere in there should have got a DFC. Yeah. I got two. One of them was because I did the Iron Hand tactics, mm -hmm. and it was kind of in recognition of the success of that. And the other one was that mission where I got hit and had a big engagement. And and that and that was a DFC. I got mm -hmm. I got awarded that at McConnell and all those Air Force guys apologized to me and said, you know, that that would be at least a silver star in the Air Force. <laughs> but not in the Navy. Uh, um, just Leighton Smith, who led the strike to drop the uh, the Thanwall Bridge, mm -hmm. did not get a silver star. Yeah. See, that's amazing, too, because that was a target that was... That was the world's most famous target. Exactly. Air, exactly, Bo. Everybody knew about that stupid the, bridge. The Air Force had gotten the the approaches pretty well. The bridge was not really very usable. This was a big walleye hit the pedestal, dropped the bridge in the span in the river. Mm -hmm. And Snuffy did all the planning. And of course, he ended up being a four star. <laughs> so, you know, he did all right. He did yeah. all right in the Navy, but uh, yeah. he, he just recently passed Army. away. Huh? He did, yeah, he just recently passed away. He not, uh, we were roommates for both of those cruises, the mid oh, yeah. and the and the seventy two cruise. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and he ended up. Yeah, he was not happy with it. You yeah. know, the up that's in Stephen Kuntz's book, Dragon Jaw. Yeah. I think stuff he wrote the San Juan portion of it. Uh, but the guy that actually hit the bridge was his wingman. It was the wingman's walleye. Uh -huh. And and Snuffy's walleye was close behind, but there was enough that you the, the wingman's walleye was first in, so it was a clean shot mm -hmm. and there was tape of it, you know. Yeah. And by the time Snuffy's was in there, this the pedals had already been hit. It was milliseconds difference. Yeah, and Snuffy probably got a hit too. But he, as the strike leader, uh, I think. Well, I think uh, Mark Baldwin got a DFC yeah. as he should have uh, as a wingman getting that yeah. big wall I hit on the bridge. Even though there, everybody had. I mean, I had probably. At least ten missions against the San Juan Bridge, <laughs> so it was just something that you know. You just it was hard. It was so well designed, designed by the same guy that did the Eiffel Tower, and they had sand. I did not know that. Same guy that did the Eiffel Tower designed the San Juan Bridge, and of course the Vietnamese by then had sand all you know. So the bridge was hard to oh, knock. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of the. It was probably the most heavily defended target in Vietnam at that time period, yeah. wasn't it? Well, Hanoi was. <laughs> Hanoi was oh, I know Hanoi was. I think too, I but. think the roughest is was the Than Wa, the 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 Thud Ridge approach from the northwest, having to go through almost in certainly make a MIG opposition yeah. followed by Sam opposition, yeah. followed by local targets. So yeah. somebody that had 100 missions over North Vietnam, if you were one on five pilot, you probably had at least 25 of them to Hanoi down Thug mm -hmm. Ridge. Where in the Navy, mm -hmm. I ended up with 305 missions, and I probably had five or 10 missions comparably in the yeah. Hanoi. Now, I had lots of missions around Haiphong and Than Hoa Bridge and Vin and all that, Six Bravo, and mm -hmm. some mining missions at Hangay and in Haiphong, but I didn't have to go into the heart of downtown like the Domer Bridge Raid. I mean, you know, those guys 
I mean, you're you're bombing down down Hanoi. The one that the closest one I had, which where we were very fortunate not to, that we came back from, uh, that bridge was eight miles from Hanoi. I feel like it was a turn point. You know, I mean, it was it was uh, getting there. You know, we were certainly mm-hmm. up there, Meg country. Yeah, but uh, we didn't have Megs, but we had Sam's from a couple different directions, and uh, we were fortunate to. to I, I went by to prepare for this discussion. My website and the uh, the tape of the SA twos uh, sounds in my laptop did not work today. I don't know what. There's a two minute tape. Yeah, that's on that mission to the bridge, and uh, recorded by Ray Thomas. It's chilling. Yeah, Bo, I listened to it several times. It's chilling. It is. I mean, when you think of that's what it's like when you get your nose up there. Uh, in North Vietnam, and six problem anywhere. You one once because you don't have one sight. You have two or three going, and there could be five or six missiles in the air. Some people report like twenty and thirty. I don't know about that, but I've seen you know up to five. Yeah, and that's in that particular mission for 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 my wingman and I at the rolling point, which we could not really make out the target. The weather was. Broken weather. Where yeah, fighter pilots said said the weather was fine. Well, it was fine for the fighter pilots because it was <laughs> it was fine above five thousand feet. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. five thousand feet was broken, so yeah. it was hard to see in there. We, and I was pushing it to get up there, and probably too hard. And we rolled in. We probably had the my wingman was a good wingman, and he probably was at the right distance apart yeah. to to have the, the for the fan song to not sure be sure whether it's one or two targets yeah. the other thing is they were pretty much shooting at 90 degrees to us which means if the if it went off right at where we were all of that stuff is going past us yeah. so in most cases the sams dudded but they passed one of them passed between me and my wingman either if uh-huh. it had gone up, neither one of us would have come back so it was it was a dicey mission, mm-hmm. and I think Ray's now Ray's tape. That's only a little short portion. I mean, he's yeah. forty. He, that's that only two mission. minutes. Yeah, that's right. Yes, uh, and you got where it was just chaos. Listening, I prefer the ECM gear in our sixty-seven or the APR twenty-five because mm-hmm. we actually studied the tapes. Because we were the Iron Hand Squadron, yeah. So during the transit, I had gone and shot the strike at at a point ago and been got my ECM training at at uh, uh, the Navy base. Jesus, miss me. I had tapes of spoon rests and tapes of flap mm-hmm. wheel and fire can and tapes of the fan song, and every pilot in VA fifteen studied those tapes. Mm-hmm. So, could because anybody could have been flying an Iron Man mission, and so when you entered and you started hearing the acquisition of the spoon rests, you know, and then you had a the fire can and you listen listen to the fire can lock on, and then the range gate pull off of of the uh, ALQ fifty one break the lock, and you could hear it happening. You didn't have to look; you could hear. Yeah. We were all ECM operating. It was different as a pilot, as a bomber pilot. You still, you still were able to hear that as a wingman. And then, so if you got locked on with a with a fire can, you knew it. Yeah. And you knew there was fifty seven or eighty five coming your way, unless you then you did jink. You know, you yeah. you had to jink the right length of time in the right direction, and then you could hear the lock break. And you'd say, okay, you know, this this is effective what we're doing. You couldn't do that. In 72, it was all automated. The system told you what it was. You weren't listening to the actual uh-huh. PRF the radars. You were looking at what the computer, and I, I felt much better <laughs> being able to hear the <laughs> PRF because of the, compu- the computers in A7 would get confused because there'd be so many in the air. Mm-hmm. And and it it was kind of you get to Hanoi. That's, I mean, there were so many fan songs up. You can't you know, discern maybe, that. And you know, maybe an ECM airplane 
they could target jamming all that. I'm sure they're doing their thing mm -hmm. while it happened. Hey, so tell everybody when you say hear it, let tell everybody that that system actually puts something in your headset. Right. Okay. Audio in your headset. So yeah, as you're coming radars. in, you're listening to this radar, like when you're approaching the coast and the spoon rest is an acquisition radar, and you're listening to that spoon rest, and that spoon rest is telling the air defense guy, okay, these airplanes are coming. So you can kind of visualize the battlefield. That's what, And you got much better. When, in, in the 72 crews, I actually had some out-of-body experiences. I was up several thousand feet. I was in the airplane as lead, but yeah. mentally I was up out of there looking at this division and where the sections were and the big picture. And I was up, I mean, it was that out of body kind of thing. Really quite strange. You're not afraid. You're pretty, you, when you first couple times you get, you're pretty concerned about things. Yeah. But once <laughs> you learn, once you've been through it a few times and you start seeing that the guys that are getting shot down are doing they're predictable, maybe cautious. Like those 10 guys, nobody got shot down until July 4th, 1967, when Phil Craig, you know, he's the fraternity brother of Dave Parsons, had been there. He was one of, we call us ourselves the J.O. Mafia. <laughs> and, and he didn't come back. So then that's, and I put in the website, that changed everything for all of us because he was, as good as any of us. So that meant that he wasn't shot down because he just screwed up. He got shot down. He was, it was a golden BB kind of thing. Yeah. So that meant any one of us was then, you know, the chance of getting through that deployment. When you're there and you lose two pilots out of 23 in the first seven days and you got four months to go, didn't look, didn't look good. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Now it turned yeah. out. We didn't lose another guy until Pete Schoffel got shot down and became a prisoner. And uh, that was in October. And Pete and I are very good friends. I ride with him to lunch, lunches twice a month. And uh, he was John McCain's roommate for six months. So uh, he has a lot to say about John McCain. Uh, uh -huh. A lot of good things. John McCain was one of the bravest people who have ever been a POW. Yeah. And uh, he, had, he had some issues that were not, you know, not so good, but uh, as far as his behavior as a prisoner of war, couldn't be any better. So, and he was really banged up when he got out of the plane, too, wasn't he? He was. He was. And he was when he got out. He came down and became, he was the executive officer of the A7 RAG, which is the training group for the A7s. And my buddy, my flight leader, uh, Possum Terrell, was the CO in 74. Mm -hmm. And you got John McCain as your XO. But he had to tell him, you know, to be CO 174, you were supposed to have been the commanding officer of a fleet squadron. Mm -hmm. And John McCain never was. Shoot, he got shot down on like his seventh flight. Yeah. So he really didn't, he really wasn't a combat tested person. Yeah. And he had never been a CO of a squadron. But those POWs got offered, you know, kind of their choice. So I, mean, I can't argue with that so yeah. much. And, uh, when he was CO 174, I went when I went through the rag as a PXO, mm -hmm. going on, when I was commanding off on my way to be CO of an A7 squadron. Uh, he was the CO. He is Don McCain. Uh, he moved moved on. He was a better senator than he was CO 174. <laughs> but, but you can't. And he was going after the same bridge, wasn't about, he? You know, when I think about, you know, when I was going through flying the 105 and having a great time, and P. Schofield was sitting there in prison, you know. Yeah. I think about it all the time, uh, how tough it was. And those guys got through it. Anyway. Bo, have, I, have a, we, I, I have an uncle, Bo, shot yeah, down four yeah. days before Christmas in 1965, was there for seven years. Seven years. And an F-4. Yeah. Got shot down his very first mission. His very first mission. He'd only been in, in country, I think, five days. Yeah, he, left, he left my house like uh, nine days before he got shot down. He came over to see us when he was living at George Air Force Base. And he was there for seven oh, years. Oh, yeah. I, I, George, I love George Air Force Base. Why is well, that? Well, because that's where we went on our weapons test from the 105. And we had <laughs> F-4s there. And yeah. we could jump on F-4s and 
uh, do drag session with the F4. You know, you get with an F4 and start out at 350 knots and go to military power. The F4 is going to go right out in front of the 105. And then both airplanes get in burner. And at about 600 knots, the 105 just goes flying by. <laughs> The F4 under rate is 750. Yeah. And the F4, everybody in the F4 has seen that video of the, of the F4 with pitch hog failure where the yeah. airplane flops up and down, the two yeah. en- engines go flying out. So nobody gets really excited at a thousand feet yeah. for going in an F4 going much over 650. And, uh, but we did all our ACM and we did our at uh, and George Air Force Base. Yeah. And I recently went, you know, of course, it went the way of a lot of bases. You know, it's, yeah. it was great flying at George. Yeah. And really good liberty in, in Riverside. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Everybody over go the, down to the beach. Over the hill. Yeah. Yeah. Just over the hill from Los Angeles. Yeah. Hey, absolutely. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. You, you talk about the Mark 20 Rock Eye. Tell everybody why that was, a, you know, you, yeah, and you mentioned, you know, you could toss it. But tell everybody what's inside that thing that made it yeah, such a good yeah. weapon, too. And uh, the rock eye is a cluster weapon. So, you know, in, in, in the rules of the international, this is supposedly an illegal weapon. It was just um, ridiculous to me that anybody tries to judge wartime with civilian uh, uh, rules. You know, I'm reading a bunch of books, and I'll get to the question. I'm reading a bunch of books about Africa written by by this guy, uh, Ralph no, Wilbur Smith. And you have the two sides there, and the white side is killing as many natives. Yeah. And if they can do it, they'll get the wives and the kids out and massacre them. And then yeah. the Indians are trying to, if they if they get a white female, they're using her up. And the white guy in the book who has, was in charge when they, when they shot all the women and children, uh, war makes a monster of men. And he, he refused to do any more, and he became a logistician. In the 1970s, when the, the guy, that the, the, the Rhodesian native guy, was responsible for some pretty horrific acts, but ended yeah. up being a prime minister, said the same thing, you know, war makes monsters of men. Well, if you aren't a monster in a war, you get beat. You know? yeah. <laughs> so yeah. do things... So cluster weapons are definitely effective. I did I did a lot of tactics against Soviet surface action ships with rock eyes. And the rock eyes, I forget the number of bomblets, 273 or something. Yeah. Large number of bomblets. And those bomblets are spread out. So they, they're pretty good any personnel weapons, except they're capable though a rock a, a rock eye bomblet will penetrate six inches of steel. So I didn't know that. It's going right through wow. a tank, and it's going right through the the hull of a ship. Uh, it burns its way through, and mm-hmm. so it's really. And when I used to brief flag officers uh, about war at sea against uh, the Kirov or something, mm-hmm. I would have a rock eye bomb and I'd toss it to the end. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty impressive weapon because in the A seven you can saturate like a football field, so it's hard to miss with a rock eye. Uh, and a computer can put it. And if you got four of them per airplane, you can uh, you can really do a lot of damage with them. They were great uh, flak suppression mm-hmm. things because you can you have two flak suppressors with two rock eyes each. You're throwing fifteen hundred bomblets at the fan, the fire can, and yeah. the in the website. You're killing mm-hmm. you're killing that crew. They're very effective. And I don't know, you care. So we carry a couple of rock eyes everywhere. Our normal road wreck. Now, this is just with A7s, four, four 500 pound bombs and two rock eyes. You can switch back and forth between the bomb. Of course, all, the computer knows the difference. Mm-hmm. You know, don't even have to think about it. You know, you no. just, you just hit, put the flight path marker and start pulling over the even G's and yeah, you know, yeah. they come off when they're supposed to come off. And you just escape and look over the top and see what happens. So it's just pretty cool. You don't have to worry too much about controlling your airspeed or, you know, the computer does all that for you. Does all that for you. You know what, Bo? I have pictures from Desert Storm of A7s off the Kennedy and they're carrying rock eyes. Yeah. Because you can't miss that big white bomb. You know, I mean, it, it looks like nothing else with that red nose fuse on it and everything like that. But 
Yeah, I mean, we were using it in the 90s still because of the capabilities of that particular weapon. Yeah, and of course, targets, the SCUDs were the targets over there. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. Uh, and I was good that. against the SCUD missiles. I was actually in Rion Desert Shield when Desert Storm was planned, the Desert Storm air plan was done, and I was Admiral Maz's mm-hmm. TAC air guy. And uh, the Navy had, had to bring a three star in there because the Air Force had General Davis, who was yeah. a three star. So yeah. you can't have the Air Force who wants to control all the airspace. You got to get yeah. a Navy guy in there yeah. that has the same number of stars. Now, the difference is Admiral Moss was a surface guy, mm-hmm. but he's smart as a whip. And he had been uh, the commander of Cruiser Destroyer Group 12 and had a carrier battle group. And yeah. he was Seventh Fleet. So I was in Atsugi. At Comfair Westpac, I was the ops officer there, and I was Com Orange for Seventh Fleet exercises. And I got a call. You're going with Admiral Moss. Well, they didn't say you're going to leave, and you're going to be gone for six weeks. And so we got on a P3 and went down. And finally, they got a permission to have him come in and relieve the two star. And I got to I got to see meetings with with General Schwarzkopf, Admiral mm-hmm. Davis, Admiral Moss. We we worked. It was a flag level working group, even though I was a Navy captain. The senior, there was a senior 105 uh, Wild Weasel Brigadier General yeah. who was EW in charge of that. And he and I worked really closely together. Larry Puba Henry. Yeah, I can't. He may, he, That's yes. who it is. Larry he Henry. Was, he, was, he was great. And then it turned out that uh, General Davis's deputy had been a wing commander in the F-15s, but he was the he was the deputy for the two-star amphibious guy that was there on LaSalle, and, uh-huh. and and he got moved over to General Davis's John da- John Miller, who was the 117 CO, was my student in McConnell, and, <laughs> and went from 105s to A7s in the desert, and that's what they yeah. flew in the daytime. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, it was old homes week, really was having. Isn't that interesting how important those relationships are? There, You had around you, Bo, people that you knew and that you worked with yeah. for a long time. Yeah. You know when, their, when their I capabilities. Left, and when everything. I left in 72, I went. I was supposed to go to Greenwich, to the, to the Royal Navy Staff College mm-hmm. in Greenwich. And I got changed to the Royal Air Force because I had... 300 missions, and I had all these combat time with a yeah. heads-up display built by Rochester, by Elliott Brothers in mm-hmm. Rochester, England. And they were, <laughs> the Israelis uh, wanted to talk to somebody that had flown combat with a heads-up display. And yeah. we didn't have, in our, at our uh, class at the RF, we didn't have the Israelis because we had a Jordanian, and uh, we had Jordanians and Afghans, and we had a lot of MIG, Indian MiG pilots in that squadron, mm-hmm. and we had Bander Faisal, who was the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. was in there, and I used to go glided with a guy named uh, Lord McFadden, yeah. who was one of these, he was the senior RAF officer for Desert Storm. Yeah. Commander Faisal was yeah. in charge of the air defense of, of, of or is the oil fields there. These were all oh, people yeah. that knew each other. And you'd known each other for a long time. Long, yeah. I just, just, that's the benefit of those staff colleges and those joint tours. My experience with 105 and the Air Force changed. That's why I was such a good Com Orange, because I was able to talk to 15th Air Force about B-52s. Yeah. General Hardinger got me F-16s yeah. uh, sometimes out of yeah. Korea or someplace, yeah. out of Osan. You know, it was just, anyway, it was a good way to go. And I, mm-hmm. the 105 community was a lot like the Navy F-8 community. It, just the way they did their business, how professional yeah. they were. To me, it was like being in a Navy squadron, and uh, they treated me really well. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show, episode 77. Now, there's still another hour and nine minutes of my interview with Bo Smith, so I'm going to put that one up next week. But folks, imagine 650 knots in an F-105. And everybody will tell you that that airplane, the Thud, when it went into burner, it would walk away from everything. And I remember Robin Oles talking to him on the phone and he told me, he says, yeah, the F-105s, the Thuds leave the area at like the speed of lightning. (laughs) So next week we'll finish our interview with Bo Smith. 
This episode of the Lessons from the Cockpit Show was brought to you by Wall Pilot, custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. These, again, are beautiful profiles of your favorite aircraft printed in four, six, and eight foot lengths on vinyl that you can peel off and stick to any flat surface. And yes, folks, we have found out that the patches that we do are in fact waterproof. A good friend of mine has had his AFSOC patches on the back of his truck and he's washed that truck every other week and now he's transferred them to another truck and he said they slapped right on and they're doing great so go to wallpilot.com and choose from 140 ready to print profiles mostly jets and we just added a few like the rivet joint and the cobra ball and order some of those because these are really detailed and this is how we support the show folks so go by there and order one or two of these prints for your walls folks like i mentioned we were going to have some great guests on and you heard some fantastic stuff from Bo Smith. And next week, we're going to talk to Bo about some of his specific missions over North Vietnam. And some of these are really, really scary going after these barracks and different things. Folks, again, my condolences to my very good friend, Scott Brown. I love your brother. So sorry that Tracy's no longer with us. And we'll talk to you again next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit show. 